You know what the shape of this hat is? It's circular. And now it's in motion. And we will use this hat to inspire us to learn about circular motion in the next few pages of this short video. Get ready. Now we should be able to draw some vector diagrams to represent what's happening in circular motion. So let's say you've got some object that is going in circular motion like this, as shown in this diagram here. Say it's going counterclockwise, anti-clockwise, if you're of the British persuasion. And at any point, let's say at this point down here, its uh, immediate or instantaneous velocity is going to be this direction, as that red vector shows. And if you move up a little bit, it's up here. At any point on this circle, you should be able to draw a velocity vector. Now, the direction of that is that the velocity is what we call tangential. And those velocity vectors are always being bent in towards the center of the circle. So if we are to ask to draw a vector diagram for the change in velocity, as we go from, let's say, vector A here to what we call vector B here, take a minute and pause it and see if you can draw that vector. Now, as I rewrote delta v, notice that I changed it from just final minus initial to think of it as the final plus a negative vector of the initial version. So if I'm going to draw this as a vector diagram, I'm going to start with vb, which is going up this way, and I'm going to use head-to-tail vector addition to add a negative version of v sub a. v sub a was going over to the right, but the negative version goes back this way. And so what I'm going to end up with is a resultant vector that is going back this way, and that is my delta v. Now since acceleration is delta v divided by time, that shows that the direction of my acceleration as I go from this velocity vector to this one is up this way, always directed towards the center of the circle. Here are some key points that you want to write down. And that is that any object that's in circular motion is constantly accelerating, even if it is at a constant speed. It has to be accelerating because velocity is a vector. And if you're always changing the direction of that velocity as you go around the circle, you have to be accelerating. Now, the acceleration is always directed inwards towards the center of the circle. And that's why we get the word centripetal it means always going towards the center. Many people think incorrectly about what we call the centrifugal force or the centrifugal force uh, because people know when they turn in a car they see the object on their dashboard slide to the outside as they turn left in a circle things slide to the right uh, and you feel yourself being pulled to the outside. That's only because they don't really understand what's going on with the acceleration. You know that if you're in a car and you take off forward, you go forward and your head whips back and things fly to the back of your car, uh, but you don't think it's a mysterious force that pulls you back. You know just as you accelerate forward, things get pulled, things get, your car's being pushed forward and so consequently because of your inertia, uh, you resist it and you end up at the back of the car. Same thing with turning. As your car is turning to the left, your car is being accelerated to the inwards part of that circle and you have inertia and your body and everything in your car would like to just keep going in a straight line. And so it ends up moving to the outside of your car as your car accelerates to the inside of the circle. So keep in mind the centrifugal force does not really exist. It's just a consequence of your car trying to accelerate inwards. There are two equations for centripetal acceleration or acceleration in a circle. And here is your first one. I don't really know where it came from, but I just know that it works. Now there's a second one that you should understand where it comes from. Let's say that we're trying to find the velocity of something going in circular motion. We know that velocity is going to be distance, or speed would be distance over time. The distance around the circle is going to be the circumference, which is going to be 2 pi r. And then we still have the time. It's going to be capital T, because that usually represents the period. Period is the time that it takes to get around the circle. Now, if we are going to insert this into this equation here, v squared is going to be 4 
pi squared r squared over t squared. And then plug that in to this equation, and we end up with this situation divided by r. And what do you know? One of our r's goes away. And we end up with the equation 4 pi squared r divided by t squared is also a handy equation that can be used for acceleration, and it is in your data booklet as well. In any circular motion situation, you're going to have a net or resultant force that is towards the center to cause that centripetal acceleration. However, don't think that centripetal force is a new force on top of ones you already know. The centripetal force is going to be caused by the force you do know. Take a minute and pause it and see if you can name what the centripetal force is in these three diagrams. In the first one, it is simply going to be the friction of the tires on the road that keeps it towards the center of the turn. Here, it's going to be the force of gravity or weight of the moon or satellite that's going to go over to the Earth. And here, it's actually a combination because if we look at a side free body diagram of this ball, we are going to have weight going down, and you're going to have tension going up this way. And the upper component of tension is going to perfectly cancel with the downward component of gravity. But T sub x here has nothing to balance it, and that leads to a net resultant force uh, towards the center of the circular motion. Here's a circular motion problem meant to be not too difficult. Please pause it, give it a try, and see if you can solve it. First, you want to realize they're giving you a frequency here. And you may not be overly aware that uh, frequency can be converted into period, or the time of one revolution. But first, I don't really like it in minutes. So as you see here, I converted it to revolutions per second. Now, period is equal to 1 over the frequency. So I'm just going to do the 1 divided by the point 555 revs per second, and that's going to turn it into seconds. Revolutions really is in a unit, and so I'm going to end up that way with the 1.80 seconds for every revolution. Now, my next step is I'm going to try and find the acceleration using that slightly more complicated equation, 4 pi squared r divided by t squared. Skip forward a little bit, I went ahead and plugged in the numbers, and as you can see, I did change the 9 centimeters of the radius into meters, and once you do this, you should get a small acceleration of only 0.349 meters per second squared. And now, just as you've done before, you use Newton's second law. Now, the only horizontal force on this uh, coin is going to be the force we're looking for, the frictional force, uh, which keeps in circular motion. And we put in the mass converted to kilograms times its acceleration. And we get a very small force of only 3.8 times 10 to the negative third newtons, which is a reasonably small force for such a small acceleration of such a small object.